Fill to Capacity, Crazy Good Stories and Timely Topics, Podcast for people too stubborn to quit and too creative not to make a difference, inspiring, irreverent, and informative. Stay tuned. Hi, I'm Pat Benincasa, and welcome to Fill Two Capacity. Today's episode, Patty on Stage, Merging Theater, Therapy, and Tales for Healing. My guest is Patty Christensen, and Patty is a professional storyteller and drama specialist. She has master degrees in theology and social work. She is a licensed clinical social worker in California. She was a counselor in a domestic violence program and worked in child abuse prevention, AIDS, family counseling, mentoring, and sexual assault. She did a school violence prevention project which used drama, storytelling, and video making. She is on the staff of the Healing Arts Department at Rady Children's Hospital in San Diego as a storyteller. Now, this program brings professional storytellers, musicians, and artists to the hospital every week to assist the healing for children and families. I know, this is a lot, but she's done a lot. I got a little bit more here. She teaches and conducts workshops on storytelling, and drama skills for educators, families, ministers, literacy teams, and fellow storytellers. She is a member of the National Storytellers Network and the Storytellers of San Diego. Now, I have to say, most importantly, Patty was originally from Minnesota, and she moved to Oceanside, California, and her storytelling journey spans many countries from Southern California, well, worldwide, and we'll get into that. Patty, welcome. Well, thank you so much, Pat. It actually makes me a little tired when you're you're saying all those things, <laughs> but it, it has been a, a delightful journey. Oh, I, I can't wait to get into this. I just want to go to the heart of it right out the gate. Patty, why do you tell stories? Well, First, I just want to tell you, I was one of those little girls who, in my elementary school report cards, nearly every single one in the comment section said, Patty is a little too social. Patty talks too much to her neighbors. There is a piece about connecting with people that went all the way back to when I was, you know, a little kid that I could feel it was important to talk with people and listen with people and connect with neighbors. So sometimes I would like to go back and tell those teachers who made those comments, you know what, people pay me money to talk and listen and be connected with my neighbors. So that's that's an old piece in my heart. Well, you know, our gifts start from somewhere and there's yours. That was the beginning. That's right. In terms of why I tell stories, though, is a piece about stories, storytelling and story listening that appears to be kind of hardwired into people. That goes so far back, probably to the beginning of language, where somebody would have something happen and then come back to the camp and go, my goodness, there was a saber-toothed tiger. I I ran away. It chased me. So there's something that from long ago times Mm -hmm. that people felt an urge to tell stories. And I think it continues even to today. Oh, yes. Well, then I have to ask, having a master's degree in theology and social work, how do these areas intersect in your work? Well, my mother wants to know that sometimes. (laughs) Uh, I, I also, my bachelor's degree was in history. And sometimes people are like, what a weird combination of things. But 
history, I was always drawn. I wanted to know the story behind things. I wasn't interested in memorizing dates and battles. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know what happened to who and what went on there. Then I was always interested in the spiritual aspects mm. of, of things going on, uh, people making meaning in their lives and how does it all fit together, both in our culture, other cultures, many of the religions. So that was an interesting area of study. And then at some point I said, you know what, maybe I need to get a degree I can get a job with <laughs> after I had done all of this. And so people say, you're a social worker, do you work for the county? No, social work has a broad areas, yeah. but the part I really studied was to be a therapist. And what I kept finding, I had lots of volunteer experiences talking and going on, but I kept finding, you know what? So many people, and especially I first started in domestic violence, there are such deep wounds and stories that many times people say, I've never told anyone this before. And I found the powerful piece of healing, of being able to create a space where people come, they can tell the stories in a caring, non-judgmental way. Sometimes they have a spiritual context or a historic yeah. context. And oftentimes, you know, history of oppression comes in there. So I found kind of to my surprise, I would not as a third grader said, you know, I'm going to do this series of degrees. But all of that has come together in my life right now that allows me to use that study, those skills together. Well, that segues beautifully in my next question. You combine theater arts and storytelling with your work as a therapist in a really unique way. Can you recall a meaningful or powerful experience where this combination led to healing? Well, I use storytelling and healing in two different settings. One is in my position as a clinical social worker counselor at a nonprofit agency. And there are many times there that, as, as I say, particularly somebody might have experienced abuse, might have experienced some horrible trauma and are stuck, stuck, stuck in their life and Part of the piece as they get to know and trust builds of coming forward and managing to share what happened, what their fears were, what, what keeps them awake at night, how they have interpreted that and taken it in to feel bad, horrible, all going on. So in my counseling work, that's a regular piece. And one of the little classic things that comes out of storytelling and particularly um, narrative therapy is change your story, change your life. And so that is a powerful piece. Sometimes I meet somebody and they have for 15 years been telling the story about my husband left me. And so therefore I'm a loser and a terrible yep. person and no one will want to be with me. And working through and finding a place that says, oh, is that the story you want to mm -hmm. keep? And oftentimes like, oh, I never even thought about that. I said, yeah. well, let's, let's create a new story. So that happens in the counseling field a lot of figuring mm -hmm. out the stuck piece often. And sometimes it's not people's own stories, but a story that has been handed to them, whether by partners, parents, crazy bosses, whatever that says. This is who I am and said, let's create a new story that creates openings. Oh, I love that. You know, I taught art for 30 years. And one of the things I would often say to art students, we are our words. And mm -hmm. the reason I would say that, because they say, oh, I want to show this. It's not really that cool or this is kind of dumb. And I said, whoa, stop. No, no. Scene mm -hmm. one, take two. We are our words. How do you want to talk about your work is how you talk about yourself. And I think that it's not lost on me that here you are a storyteller. You're in a field where you listen to stories. You're the storyteller who listens to stories. And I can't think of a better combination. So you are the story listener as yes. well. Yeah. Which I yes. think is awesome. And 
people sometimes imagining the the most important thing in the storytelling world is the speaking. And of course, somebody usually needs to speak, but you can speak to yourself at home and can be helpful, but boy, to be deeply listened to, suddenly something really different happens. Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, you sent me that article about your work at Rady Children's Hospital. And I, wow, I, I could spend a whole podcast on that, but I'm going to reel myself back in. Reading that, you work with children and families. Your aim is to help children heal. And my God, you encounter kids going through chemo painful medical treatments. They're often frightened, nauseous, exhausted, or upset. Patty, what does a day at the hospital look like for you when you walk into all of that pain? What does it look like? How do you deal with that? Well, I have to tell you, I'm very, very proud of our program. It's the Healing Art Program at Rady Children's Hospital, San Diego. And it's been operating for nearly 20 years as a program that has paid professional artists. There's many volunteer artists in many places around and not to degrade uh, volunteers at all because volunteers are wonderful. But there is a piece at our hospital that they made a decision. We don't want people to either be volunteers or even contract workers, we would like to bring you on as a paid employee so that we give the official stamp of approval that says this is being valued at the hospital. So that's one of the things I love that I'm Mm -hmm. so proud of. So I always say, I have the funnest job at the hospital. I never need to poke anybody to, um, you know, make them make them do therapy, get them ready for for surgery that they don't want to have. The whole premise of our program is artists of of all kinds are able to come, and we usually get referrals from various staff members who said, "Oh, I thought of somebody for you," or "Here's here's somebody we're really struggling with. What can we do?" So oftentimes we come check in with email and have a list of referrals. There's also a little bit of a serendipitous piece. Sometimes walking by, you hear some screaming and peek in a little bit and said, could we be of help here? And sometimes they're like, no. And sometimes they're like, yes. Hmm. Oh, we get the list and then start the place of going to the, the various forms of rooms, waiting rooms, larger areas. Oftentimes it'll be coming in the hospital, I use a a drama storytelling partner, James Nelson Lucas. So we are often together. Introduce ourselves. Hello, we're Patty and James from Healing Arts. Wondering whether you're interested in a story or a magic trick today. And one of the things we found was sometimes a story sounds like either it's going to be too baby or too involved. We once had a teenager said, well, that doesn't sound too lame if we... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> do a magic trick, which often has a story as part of it. And super important, and I think it, this doesn't happen so often, but they get the right to say, yeah, come on in, that sounds good, or not today, or that doesn't sound good. Now, sometimes parents are appalled. It's like, oh, I'm so sorry, he's being so rude. There's a million things at the hospital that kids don't have any choice of. You can't say, I'm not taking my medicine. I don't want an IV. Don't take another shot. But you can say, no, today doesn't seem like a good day for a story. And that is that just in itself, the opportunity to say yes or no to something creates a little bit more control over this kid's life that may be out of control. So that's a critical piece, yes or no. And I want to stay really clear that it's totally their choice. But if they say, "Uh, yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Or what kind of stories you got? So I I also do some storytelling performance on the stage and shows Mm -hmm. and whatever, where you have your lineup, you know, your set list, you know what you're going to be doing at a place like a children's hospital. You don't know. 
it is in some ways improvisation at its best. That <laughs> the show up and find out you might go, we've got this great story about a princess and a dragon. I hate princesses. Okay. Or how about you feel about animals or going on? Mm -hmm. So a lot of stories in the repertoire. And it also is important. And we've found over time, some kids are not actually that interested in hearing a story. They would like to tell me a story. Ah. And maybe a story they know, maybe a story they made up. Occasionally, story of their favorite video game, which is a really like, mm -hmm. and then, and then, and then. <laughs> it's like, okay. But again, sometimes that is really what kids need, is to have somebody who will listen to them one of my favorite kiddos that, that I saw on and off for a while, one day, this little boy said to me, I got an idea. Why don't we make up a story and you and I are grandmas who are best friends? <laughs> okay, Let, <laughs> let's go. And so in the way of how it goes, that if you learn how to do improv, acting storytelling mm -hmm. you know the deal is you don't know where it's going to go you're always just going to agree and keep going forward so you know said oh one day the two grandmas they were outside and and what were they doing the boy says they were planting hamburger trees oh okay. yes they were okay <laughs> now one of the things having done this for a very long amount of time i have great confidence wherever the story is going to go I will be able to help bring it to a satisfying end. We can't tell 15 hour stories. At some point, our time is up or we're noticing, ooh, the kid is getting tired or the IV pole is beeping and the nurse is needing, needing to come. So needing to be tuned in yeah. and just know, okay, let's see where it's going to go. Oh, and then you know how the story ended? And the boy said, the grandma made cookies for everybody. Yes, she did. And they were so happy. Yeah. So sometimes it's going to be, and a lot of times those are not great art. As you're like, oh, there we go. That's the best story. But it, one of the things that is so important with story, and this happens in therapy, but also if you're dealing with health issues, is if you are immersed in the story you're all going on you're thinking what's happening mm -hmm. next you're creating the visions in your brain you sort of can't also concentrate on how much your tummy hurts or how yeah. scared you are about the knee surgery or what's you know what's going to happen later on it's a very present moment time where you just get to be there mm -hmm. immersed in what's going on and that in itself especially if you spend a lot of time living in great pain is super good blessing well i love how you bring in the time element because being in a hospital and especially faced with all those things you're in your head you're thinking about it you're scared or whatever and the beauty of what you do is that you pull people into present moment you pull them like out of the back seat of their worry and their suffering. And you say, hey, let's go for a ride here. And it, it must be a great relief to the parents as well that you can just step in, do that, and then walk away. It is. Some things in the hospital are short term. Kids are still getting their tonsils out mm -hmm. or you got a broken arm. You have an easy surgery, two nights all going on. But some kids are really sick or in the hospital for months and months yeah. and months worth of time. Yeah. And so those parents, uh, you know, a, a tremendous amount of stress and yeah. pressure on them. And some kids, some kids are pretty self-sufficient, but some kids, when they're scared, when they're sick, they are clingy, clingy. They want mom, dad, grandma, whoever to be with them 24-7, yeah. which is exhausting. And so, especially some of those kids that we know over time and come in, the parent sees us, they know their kid is safe. That's, that's a time somebody might say, I'm going to go grab a coffee or can I pick up lunch? I'll be back in about 20 minutes or I, I need to talk to the doctor. Is that okay? 
So it's a pleasure just to be able to say, yes, your kid, yep. they're doing fine. You do what you need to do and come back and, and we'll take it from there. Now, I want to flip the story here and ask you, have you encountered a story that made you question or rethink your own life's journey? Ah, well, I will tell you, boy, many stories over time become one of those stories that just like captures your heart <laughs> or, or makes you you're like, oh my goodness. I once heard an amazing nationally known storyteller tell a story about making some really important life decisions. And it was at a festival. It was an amazing, well-crafted, great story. Mm -hmm. But it gave me a little bit of answer and peace to something mm. I was struggling with. And after she was done performing, I went up and I thanked her that just how much that story had meant to me. And she smiled and she said, ah, uh, yes, that story really does its work. And I thought, oh, that's true. There, you know, there are many stories that are entertaining, fun, little all going on. But there's some stories that go in a deep place. And I was like, oh, this story somehow has work to do and might be the right words at the right time for the right person. Yeah. Oh, that's beautifully said. Now, I'm curious, reading about you and uh, all the things that you've done, what brought you to China and what did you do there? Well, one of the fun things about something like storytelling is there are times when cool opportunities come up. So my partner heard about an opportunity. There were some people being put together that were going to go to China to work at a, a summer school, three-week summer school, teaching Chinese elementary and middle school kids English through using theater, games, visual arts, and music. And they'd asked if he wanted to do that. I said, no, that's not my jam, but came home and said, do you think, would you be interested in doing something like that? And I did a little, a little bit of research and found out they were putting together a crew of 20 people. Uh, many of them were classroom teachers, although not all. Mm -hmm. Everybody had experience working with kids and working in educational setting. And so they divided us up into to teams. And I was in the story drama team. And we had a lot of stuff. We headed off. We were in China for five weeks. The first week was preparing. Then we had three weeks of teaching the kids and then, then a week of traveling at the end. Wow. So there were actually 700 kids who were in this program. It was, it was a big program and the kids, they, they were in their little cohort and they rotated around. So everybody got all four of those areas each week and we had different topics and one of the things that was interesting and challenging was at the end of each of those weeks, we put on an all school show. So with 700 kids in, in an all school show in, in English. So cool, cool, cool project. It was amazing. And what we found, all of these kids, so I worked primarily with fourth and fifth graders, all of them had been learning English since they were in first grade, way ahead of, of the game for American yeah. of learning languages. But what they were learning was reading and writing. And so they were actually pretty proficient in that. But speaking, singing, moving, acting things out was something they had had no experience in. So we had a chance to open the door for, for these kids. And one of the things that we really found, of course, you can learn all kinds of vocabulary, but, you know, okay, you know, a lot of vocabulary, uh, story and acting was a great entry for hmm. those kids to, to learn some more, as well as one of the things that the kids often were talking about, they all had 
English teachers who were native Chinese speakers. So they had oh. never heard anybody who was native speakers. That brings me to a huge question. How did the cultural context impact your approach and delivery to stories? Well, it was so interesting to find what are the things that, that were familiar to the kids and that we could count on, piggyback on. One of the things, of course, this has shifted some now, but it was still at the time of the one child policy yeah. in China. So stories that people had brothers and sisters and aunties and uncles and cousins, like they kind of have heard a little bit. Nobody had any brothers or sisters or, and mostly wow. their parents were also only children. So they, so, wow. so, you know, you're thinking like, oh goodness. Okay. Didn't know that. One of the things that was quite interesting, one of the units that they had us do was careers and playing with what kinds of things might you want to be when you grow up? These were very middle-class families. And there were a lot of answers. Kids want to be I'm going to be like my dad. I'm going to be a boss I'm gonna, <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, a lawyer or a doctor. But one of the other popular things that kids wanted to be, they wanted to be an American FBI agent because they had seen movies and that looked like that would be a cool job. You know, I'm not sure that's a realistic career goal for you. But so we were doing some things going on. They had the kids, as often happens in drama, well, dress up in the costume what you want to do. And the FBI kids all brought plastic guns to school to show, you know, there we go. The American teachers who work in the schools know, oh, you can't bring oh, yeah. that you know, tolerance of weapons at school. And the Chinese teachers who are working with us is like, wait, you're in America. Everybody has guns in America. It's like, oh, oh schools, you can't bring guns to school. They said, it's their costume. It's like FBI agents got to have guns. So some of the time we were having some of those discussions of saying, okay, no, yeah. <laughs> but they're like, wait, everybody in America has guns. We watch the movies. Yeah. We know guys. I said, well, I actually don't have a gun. Oh, the other thing I had brought along photos of my house I lived in. 100% of these kids all lived in apartments. They're, oh. they're like, wait, that whole building is just for your family? Yeah. So you have a story of a little house. So that I don't even know what a little house is. Yeah. We all live in a, an apartment and it's like, no, no. So sometimes we would hit things, you know, the cultural assumptions, you wouldn't even thought of that. Yeah. But they were in shock. And I also had, had a picture of me with my eight nieces and nephews and they were like wait all in one family all of those children yeah it's not even that many but wow in their world like whoo that was crazy talk about cross-cultural richness now i'd like to go in a, a different direction maya angelo said there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. What would you say to someone who feels that their story is not important or interesting, so why bother? Oh, so many people feel that. Think, if I'm not a famous movie star, if I haven't jumped off a cliff to save a baby, you know, my story is just ordinary as it goes on. When we do storytelling workshops, of course, there's many, many types of stories that people can tell and literary stories or folk tales or things like that. But if you're looking at stories, personal stories, true life stories, sometimes memoir, oftentimes that's the initial piece people say, nothing ever happened to me. I have boring life. Who'd want to hear about that? And so with that, then there becomes, in some ways, when I look at it about fishing for the story. And oftentimes, and as an art teacher, you might have found that just give people a, a sheet of paper said, do anything you want. It's like, I don't know. But if there's an idea, if there's a prompt, if there's something. So, so to say, okay, write a story about anything. Your brain is like a little draw blank. Yep. But you say, 
tell me a story about how did you get your name? What's interesting about your name? And suddenly they're like, oh, this is who I'm named after. Or my parents, they were going to name me this or all going on. Or my mom just made up the spelling of this name and all going on. Suddenly, like you got something that you're fishing for. So there are pages and pages on the, the internet and books and all going on of writing or storytelling prompts that just says, hmm. but tell about a time when you got a scar. Oh, when I was in third grade, I was riding my bike. I was all going, I wiped out and then it was bleeding all over and they had to, suddenly there's a deal. So we have to let go of that pressure on ourselves that it has to be a significant enough story Sometimes some of the delightful stories to listen to aren't even the most amazing thing, but it's something that brings your audience back to, oh, I remember. Actually, I will tell you, I was just at a workshop and they had us go back to a childhood home, someplace that you went to that you had happy memories in, because of course, sometimes we have places people don't have happy memories, and, yep. which are other kinds of stories, but said, I want you to imagine there you were, you're going in and you see something. And I popped right into my grandma didn't have city water. They had well water and they had in their kitchen, a bucket that was sitting there. There was a metal dipper and you could go in there and you could drink the water out of that. Well, suddenly, and I hadn't thought about that in years and years and years, but in the workshop, I told that story. Three other people immediately had, had stories of weird things about water when they were a kid. Oh, oh, my grandma had the sulfur smell in her water all going on. So something that sometimes happens is one story begets some other stories. It yeah. On something inside. So even though, okay, was that the most exciting story on the planet about I took a drink out of the dipper from... But it was actually kind of uh, fascinating and satisfying to play around with that a little yeah. bit and just, oh, what else comes along, along those lines? So in your work counseling, how have your skills as a storyteller enhanced your counseling sessions with children or adults? How does that play into your work? Well, there is a whole field and theory in counseling that's called narrative therapy okay. that really has to do with the story. And sometimes, for example, one of the most prominent narratives we might have people do is help create their trauma narrative okay. of go back about either a specific situation or a series of traumatic things that went and kind of explore those and put those, like kind of file those together all okay. going on. That is a very common use of story that comes in there. Okay. Um, and also it is exploring what story are you telling? That's all good. Another piece though, that I'm going to say that's a little trick in my storytelling bag is, especially with kids who are struggling with something that is a common situation. Just telling a kid, oh yeah, that happens a lot, isn't very comforting. Yeah. But to say, you know what? That reminds me of another girl who how old are you again? Eight. Oh, she was she was eight and a half. You never want to be younger. That would be bad. But a little older that and she once told me that this happened to Lila, this is what she all, all kind of did. It's like, oh, really? Oh, and then what did she do? Well, I don't know. What do you think? Suddenly we go from lots of kids had that experience to this mythical kid. Now, sometimes not mythical. Sometimes it, it really mm -hmm. is. We've been doing this a long time. I know a lot of kids teen stories, but I also know a lot of situations that are common but there is something that's very satisfying. Yeah. Or I have even had times when kids are really stuck and I said, can I ask you some advice? I got a kid at another school. You don't want it to be, and they're like, what's their name? Oh, remember, I can't tell you know their name, but he's really having a problem. And so let me tell you, would you be able to help me figure out what he should do? And suddenly crafting a little story, Bobby, who's over at that other school, 
And he had some kids who were really teasing him, bullying, and he didn't know what to do. And they would call him this as like, what do you think? Well, I'm sort of thinking he might tell the noon duty because she might be able to help. Now, what if, oh, I, that's a great idea. So suddenly we have somebody who we can externalize a little mm -hmm. bit. Sometimes it's a lot easier trying to help figure out what somebody else should do. <laughs> I'm really good at that as opposed to what am I going to do myself? So the story part of that sometimes becomes a really helpful tool. You know, Patty, I'm an artist. So as you're talking, I get these visual images. And what I love about what you just said is I envision this personalized threshold. Now, doorways are a threshold. Every time we go in and out of a door, we go into a new beginning, a room, outside, whatever. And what mm -hmm. you do in your work is you create a personalized threshold for this child to walk through. Oh, that's beautiful. Excellent. I love that. That's a powerful image. And I think that that really is true. And I will tell you, especially, I have a great place in my heart for kids and teens because it is yeah. not easy being a young person this, these days at all. And sometimes the reason parents are bringing kids to therapy is, I don't know what to do. Or said, she won't talk to me. I, you know, I'm so worried she won't talk to me. And sometimes what kids need is somebody who's not in their family. Yes. That they can talk to their side. If I tell you this, am I going to get grounded? Because <laughs> then yeah. I don't know what I'm going to tell you. Yeah. So it can be a teacher. It can be a counselor. It can be a neighbor. But I think that there's something really important. But I love, you're right, that that is the image of come in here. It's our safe place. And I'm going to invite you in. Beautiful. So the author, Sue Monk Kid, said, stories have to be told or they die. And when they die, we can't remember who we are or why we're here. Patty, how do you see the role of deep, meaningful storytelling, like this quote suggests, in a society dominated by short attention spans, social media, and quick information consumption? Well, that's an awesome question, Pat, <laughs> because we do, we have people who they are used to, I want it quick. Can you give me an, an a sound bite? Can mm -hmm. you, you know, I, I don't have time. I have particularly teens who sometimes say, you don't mind if I'm texting while we're in therapy, right? Yep. Because we have to always have multiple things yep. going on. And, you know, that's the society we live in. So we don't want to pretend we don't live in that society yep. and hear what that's all going on. But there is something very powerful about sometimes putting down the phone, just sitting. Many of our young people don't actually even have very good listening audience skills. Because they spend so much time with screen time. Yeah. And with screen time, you have something on, you can talk right over the, you know, the video that you're watching, the movie, the video game. It, you can talk. It doesn't matter. And sometimes they're a little bit like, I have to shut up when you're telling a story. Yeah, yeah. We're right. So I do think when we can find time and create situations where kids and adults can have opportunity to listen and to speak it's very powerful and a lot of times it takes a little bit of extra help now i just will say because i sounds like i'm really bashing the the whole screen and video of course when covid hit yeah. the storytelling world you know screeched to a halt for a while i said oh my goodness what's all going to happen and so there was a lot of looking and scratching head and trying to figure out many people in both the local, national, and actually international storytelling world had to learn how to do Zoom and yeah. go online and create both video, sh video uploaded shows. Our Storytellers of San Diego created a very hefty YouTube channel, which we had never had before. 
because of course, if you're telling a story on Zoom, easy to record. Suddenly we had, oh, good quality recordings going on. And what we also found, and it was fascinating because often storytelling would be considered such a local, local thing. If you're, if you're not at the local library, you can't get a chance to hear. Suddenly there were opportunities around the country and yeah. around the world where we could have a story swap that is welcome anybody who's got the link and then people had to learn how do you figure out time zones and yep. and how does that go and how do you, how do you mute yourself when you're all going on but there are still to this day many storytelling programs and opportunities that are happening via the internet so i know storytelling yep in Ireland. I know storytellers in New Jersey. I know storytellers uh, around in so many places. And so if we can keep from just being so like technology bad, let's find where the barriers and the places we don't want it to turn into. We never actually see people in real life because in-person audience is a whole different show and it's very satisfying. But We've become convinced that there are opportunities to share stories around the world in yep. ways that have never been possible before. If anything, from COVID, it turned the globe into an international neighborhood. Yeah. And yes. yeah, was it great? No. Was teaching art and science and lab classes great on Zoom? No. But there was also in that separation, this hunger to communicate, this hunger to connect. And podcasting took off. Artists began to show their works online using social media. Right. Musicians performed. So it introduced us to a different way of communication. But there's also that need for eye-to-eye -eye contact, that ability, if you can, to sit with someone, not texting, but kids, I'd be teaching, they'd pull out their phone. I'd say, oh, wait a minute, you got to put that away. I need to make meaningful eye contact with you this moment. And they would all roll their eyes. And I say, now, now we can have meaningful conversation. But I knew my shelf span was very limited. Two or right. three sentences, you get it out and you move on. So we are dealing with a whole different, <laughs> a whole different world here. It is. And I think as elders in that world, we sometimes catch up, but also to, to be able to see, oh, you know what? We know some things about meaningful eye contact, yeah. about sitting with somebody, being able to you know touch their hand or give them a hug that, oh, that actually felt really good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, it did. Who knew? That, exactly. Uh, so Patty. If people want more information about what you do, how do they contact you? I have a website, www.pattystory.com, P-A-T-T-I-S-T-O-R-Y, one word, dot com. Okay. And if anybody is on Facebook, they can just look me up under Patty Christensen. Happy to be in contact with people. And if people are interested in learning more about storytelling and being a storyteller, mm -hmm. there is an amazing amount of information online. Learning storytelling, suddenly you have online courses, as well as most everywhere now has some kind of a local storytelling group. So that's another thing we really found out more about wow. when we had COVID this like, oh, there are all of these small groups of people who are together telling stories in circles, which kind of makes your heart happy. Whoa, what a conversation. Patty, you gave us a glimpse of this intricate tapestry of storytelling that's woven into your work as counselor and teacher and your unique fusion of theology, social work, and theater arts becomes a vehicle for transporting us to our better selves. My takeaway from what you do is everyone's story matters. And you, Patty, change lives one tale at a time. Thank you so much for coming on today. What an honor. Well, thank you so much, Pat. And it really was a pleasure. 
And I also just want to confirm in your work, you are also bringing forward stories and that that's such important work. So I honor that also. Well, thank you, Patty. And thank you, listeners. If you've enjoyed today's Fill to Capacity, tell a friend. No, tell them a story about what you heard. Thank you.